Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. Archaeology, one aspect of... Science! Welcome to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. Welcome to our home. We are just so, so delighted that many of you have... Over the years, enjoyed Sci Friday. We've been at this for a long time. More than seven years. Yeah. yeah. You know what? We've been with, we have been part of Skywatch TV for a long time as well. It was about eight years ago today as we record this that we came out to Missouri for the first time and saw Whispering Ponies Ranch. Yeah. And that was really what uh, sealed the deal for us as far as uh, convincing us to become part of this team. So uh, we are blessed we to be are. here and blessed that your support makes it possible for us to continue doing these programs, the mm -hmm. research, the writing, and uh, the, the blathering. Um, <laughs> Lots of that. So uh, please keep up with all of our work at uh, our free mobile app, which gets uh, you all of our video content. This program, Unraveling Revelation, our weekly Bible study, my weekly podcast interview program. Old PID uh, radios. Uh, yes. And that, some of our that's classic... Where we got started. Classic archives going back to 2005 that we're uploading as time allows. Oh, just, yeah. Tom just, Horn, oh, uh, yeah. David Flynn. L.A. So, Marzulli. L.A. Marzulli. Yeah. So many people that, that are, you know all their names. Well, they were brand new to us when we started in 2005, and we got to interview a lot of them. We did, and that's what led us down this uh, journey, into this journey that uh, continues to this day. So uh, uh, just added another 40 hours worth of content uh, just in the past week. So uh, take advantage of that. Uh, the free app available at gilberthouse.org slash app or scifriday.tv slash app. And uh, thank you. Those of you who've told us at conferences that you put this program on when you are going to bed <laughs> and you fall asleep listening to us pontificate and blather, uh, there's a lot of content on this app. So if you just need something to put you to sleep, download our app, mm -hmm. gilberthouse.org slash app. That's right. Well, uh, archaeology, uh, DNA, you were um, sharing something with me earlier today that kind of blew my mind as far as the, uh, the accepted, and we've, I think, agreed. The, the science. The science is never really settled, as they claim, <laughs> and that the official yeah. history is not really settled either. You know, it really is not, and uh, um, we're going to actually connect this story to... Um, a topic that we're discussing on this week's Unraveling Revelation, and that is the book of Enoch, first Enoch, and oh. the book of parables within it. Mm -hmm. uh, the book of giants is familiar to almost... The book almost, of the watchers. Sorry, book of the watchers, yes. is familiar to almost all of you because that is a parallel to Genesis 6. Right. So it's First Enoch six mm -hmm. and through thirty uh, through thirty six. Okay, as far as the verses, right? Um, it tells the same story, but it's a little bit more specific. Yeah, more detailed. Gives us more information. Well, for years and years, I, I mean, I, my degrees in biology, and and when when you go to a huge school like Indiana University, and you go to into the sciences, biology, it's such a big topic that. Your advisor says, okay, what track do you want to go on? Well, I chose molecular biology and genetics. So that's what I studied for four years in order to get my degree. Because of that, I find it fascinating anytime I read a scientific report, news of a discovery of DNA within the current human. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to speak as an evolutionist would speak. Um, within the current version of Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. within our postmodern, that's what they call it now. It's no longer modern. We're now postmodern genetic um, genome. They call it Neanderthal mm -hmm. or uh, Denos Denisovian. Denisovan. De yeah. Denisovan. That's what the species they're referring to that had larger bodies. And um, they now 
find that it was assumed that they were stupid right. and that they lived in caves. Now they're, oh, wait, they had a pretty good brain capacity. Larger than Maybe Homo they sapiens. weren't as stupid. And maybe they're the ones who built some of these uh, cyclopean structures that are found throughout the world. Now, it's been assumed for hmm. decades that this species, again, speaking as an evolutionist, that this version, uh, the the proto-man, the proto-human as we understand humanity, that they were in Europe. And that was pretty much their stomping grounds. Mm -hmm. Well, a story just came out today that uh, sort of defies that. It's at phys.org. Phys oh, okay. mm -hmm. And it talks about a DNA analysis that covered a lot of ground looking at uh, uh, bones, specifically teeth, and of, of long ago ancestors in South America, trying to find the journey that these individuals took. And you can do that not just by, by looking at genomes, but you can also look at strontium levels in teeth. And right, that will right. tell you where people have eaten their food. Right. So it'll tell you, okay, they were in what we call Brazil. No, they were in what we call Colombia, which is, uh, uh, into, or, or Venezuela, or Costa Rica, or Peru, or wherever. The DNA analysis showed Neanderthal. That isn't supposed to be the case. How'd they get there? Yeah, because they were supposed to be... In Europe. Europe. Yeah. And they wouldn't have had, they didn't have boats. There wasn't a land bridge. <laughs> that was the claim. They, they were stupid. They didn't have boats. You know, they, they didn't have any way of sea voyages. Maybe they had little fishing boats, you mm -hmm. know, that they, they fished locally. Nuh-uh. So how'd they get there? That's a really good question. Now, I'm looking at, uh, trying to find the phys.org story, but I'm also looking at the report, uh, well, the press release actually from Florida Atlantic University, which is one of the schools um, involved in the study, along with Emory University. Uh -huh. And they're saying that this supports archaeological data of a north to south migration towards South America, but they also discovered migrations moving in the opposite direction from south to north along the Atlantic yes, coast. Exactly. Now, isn't that strange? Yeah. Researchers discovered evidence of Neanderthal ancestry within the genomes of ancient individuals from South America. Here's the thing. If you believe in the Bible, this is explained. Because pre-flood, yeah. the watchers, the angels who decided that they were going to go to Mount Hermon, they'd been sent here, mm -hmm. it's now believed by scholars, that the Lord sent them here to take care of humanity. And almost immediately, they got down to Mount Hermon, looked at each other, Shemyaza says, hey, buddy, those are pretty ladies. Mm -hmm. Let's just take them. Yeah. And, Why not? Uh, I, so I don't take the fall for this. Let's all make a yes. mutual pact that we'll all go through and with this. And we can build an army and we can take over the throne that Adam was supposed to have because we can have some human DNA. Right. So the theory then is that what scientists call uh, Neanderthal mm -hmm. is actually perhaps influenced by outside genetic I, th I think so. I really do. Because th there is evidence that there was more than just one uh, generation. Yeah. In the, book of e in the book of First Enoch, which is, dates to about the year 250 BC. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are scholars who have looked at that and said that may be based on their misunderstanding of what's in Genesis chapter 6. Right. Drawing from that and seeing... That they're, okay. And so they interpreted this as three generations. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 6, which... Uh, and let me see if I can remember this now, because I, I wrote about this in, um, might have been Giants, Gods, and Dragons, might have been uh, yeah, Second Coming of Saturn. I think it's in both. Um, the Neanderthals, okay, the Neanderthals, the Nephilim were on the earth, it was the same thing. The yeah, Nephilim were yeah, on the earth exactly. in those days, and also after, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Right. It, it's thought by some scholars in the, in the book, uh, of the Book of Enoch that... They read into this, okay, the Nephilim, uh, the Mighty Men, and the Men of Renown were right. three separate generations. Right. And Probably th not, but, but let's just say that there may have been subsequent generations. Okay. Uh, that may be one of the reasons that the Lord says when you sin, it goes to the third and fourth generation. Mm. And these sins mm -hmm. may have gone to third and fourth generations. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they bred with one another or just continued breeding with women... 
possibly trying to get as much human DNA in there as possible. Right, right. But still maintain their powers. Right. They, and they, then, these were more powerful entities by all accounts. Yes. In not just in in uh, the Bible, but in the the um, uh, the the right pagan nations who saw these as the demigod yes. heroes of old. Now, there's a very important phrase, and after. And after, right. Which means, and after the flood, for me. Yes. And... And I think it says, not when they went in, but whenever. Well, yes. Uh, that, that word translated when in Genesis 6 can mean whenever. Yes. So that could explain the second incursion. There were, there were more fallen angels who propagated with humans after the flood. Mm -hmm. The one thing we did know, and we, we documented this in the book Veneration, is that uh, the pagans around ancient Israel venerated these spirits as their ancestral kings. Yes. The Amorites believed that they were, you know, the uh, the the council of mm -hmm. the Titans, the council of the Tidanu, who um, were part of the netherworld, connected to the Rephaim, which were the right. spirits of the demigods, Heracles, Perseus, all of those, so who could intercede for us in the land of the living yes. if you sacrificed to them. And we will yeah. talk more about that after the break, but but getting into the idea of Neanderthal be DNA being elsewhere in the world, mm -hmm. outside of Europe, yeah. I think it's explained, if you remember, that the fountains of the deep were opened up mm -hmm. during the flood. And there is a discussion about the, the, uh, the division of the land, that Peleg was named that because he, he was born during the, the A disruption. A time when the lands broke apart. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this may be what some scientists, geologists be, believe, was sometimes called Pangea. And the, that explains why we have all of these uh, rift zones, mm -hmm. like the African rift that goes through yeah. the Galilee and the, and the Dead With Sea. The Jordan River, right. Yes, mm -hmm. that's an important Hmm. point if you think about the fountains of the deep mm -hmm. yeah the abyss yes those were opening up mm -hmm. and springing forth water now post flood if it is indeed and after mm -hmm. then at least for some time after the land broke up that these entities that could go wherever they wanted to they also went into the daughters of men Hmm. And after. Mm -hmm. So I think that Neanderthal probably would be found throughout the world. Yeah, well, whether pre or post flood. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And I, would, I wouldn't call it Neanderthal. I would call it watcher DNA. Yeah. Now, hmm. and after is important because we are told, and this is an important uh, phrase, this is an important belief to remember, our kids are being told you're part Neanderthal. You have Neanderthal DNA. Well, that's entirely possible, but it does not mean that you are unredeemable. Mm -hmm. yes. Remember that. Yes. If you can ask the question, how can I be saved? Then you are redeemable. And I would argue that that's every person on this earth. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus died for all. Um, I, I think the idea that uh, there are some out there who are irredeemable yes, is a lie from the pit of hell. That I think so too. Because and I, you, when you start down that road of thinking, that line of thinking, it leads, it leads logically to madness. To, it, well, it leads to madness, but also leads to murder. Yes, it does. Because, because this person is irredeemable. I'm doing the Lord's work by taking him out. Oh, I know. Yeah. And that, sorry, don't go down that road no, because uh -huh. you can name just about any rich person in the world who is currently controlling aspects of the geopolitical world, has somehow, knowingly or unknowingly, made a pact with the fallen realm, is now theopolitical in his or her uh, uh, behavior. It doesn't mean that that person is unredeemable. Yeah. It does not. Pray for salvation for those who have power, because that power can be redirected by the Lord. The Lord has shown us in his word that he can change hearts. 
think about Saul. Right. He was hardcore going after all of those. The Saul of the, Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, yeah. exactly. Hardcore going after all of those Christians who should be following the Jewish religion, mm-hmm. should be following the, the, the rules. And he was part and parcel of murdering. They were hit squads, yeah. Yes. And uh, he was confronted in a probably very ge- geographically interesting place. And but, that's, uh, that gets but that's into the, point. Yep. the connection to the book of First Enoch hmm. and the parables that we discussed this week on Unraveling Revelation. I think this idea that the Genesis 6 paradigm, the, the book of the watchers in First Enoch, those are important concepts to remember for us today. And looking at what Jesus did in that region that you and I believe is the Valley of the Shadow of Death, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that archaeological speaking, archaeologically speaking, there are so many uh, features called dolmens, mm-hmm. these huge meg- megalithic structures, big stones, that's what megalithic means. That you and I couldn't lift them? No, no. Who did? No. Uh, well, somebody did. And somebody some of those stones did. range between 20 and one of them in the Shamir Dolmen Field outside the Kibbutz Shamir, which is about 20 miles from Mount mm-hmm. Hermon. 50 tons. 50 That's tons. heavier than two fully loaded 18-wheelers on uh, our highways today. Oh, my goodness. And think about, and we're going to have to take a break, we're going to talk about the snake at oh, Gilgal Raphael. Yeah. Think about that. <laughs> Stick around. More to come on Sci Friday. Spiritual warfare is where the rubber meets the road for us as Christians, but often we treat it as though it doesn't really exist. Well, during the month of November, we're tackling this subject head on as we celebrate the release of Sharon's new novel, The Poisoned Pawn, book eight in the Red Wing Saga, a series that teaches spiritual warfare through compelling stories featuring characters that you come to know and love. As part of this special package, we're offering the important new book by our friend Vicki Joy Anderson, They Only Come Out at Night, where she looks at the phenomenon of night terrors or sleep paralysis, examines what the medical community says about it, and then digs into the spiritual forces behind it and the good news that there is a way to make it stop. We're also offering our two-disc DVD set, Unmasking the Ancient Gods, a series of presentations on spiritual warfare, everything from the UFO phenomenon to Jack the Ripper and spiritual warfare in the 19th century, which is really where the storyline of the Red Wing Saga begins. Bought separately, this package is worth $65, but it's yours for just $35 plus shipping and handling during the month of November only. Our spiritual warfare special offer Available only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And as always, we thank you for your prayers and your support. Welcome back to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. We've got our coffee here so we can wake up. Uh, we are talking about archaeology and evidence on the land mm-hmm. that actually speaks. Those rocks are crying out, speaking about Jesus' uh, ministry in what we call the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And I think that Psalm 23 refers to that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, just 90 days out, uh, we'll be in Israel, and we can show these sites to you uh, mm. very quickly. Just go to our website, gilberthouse.org slash travel. That'll get you a look at the itinerary, and there's a p- place to reserve your spot on that tour. Um, Absolutely. By the way, when you, while you're there, shop our store, because we got some big bargains in oh, November yes. and December. Yes, uh, the holidays are ahead, and uh, so we we offering some special specials, we, we pray you take advantage of it. That's mm-hmm. how we keep doing what we do here. It, we do. It uh, keeps us going. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I like packing up those little packages. Yeah. And uh, I enjoy taking them to the, taking them to the post mm-hmm. office. The uh, the Valley of the Shadow of Death and this, this idea that um, these megalithic structures are tied to the ministry of Jesus was something that uh, I, 
I, I well, I'll say again, I stumbled onto, but not really. I think I that, think you were led. I think, to. I think I was nudged in the right direction. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm not that smart where I can put these pieces together, but every now and then, you know, I'll, I'll find something and uh, just mm-hmm. the research seems really, really interesting. And I, I discover later it's because I was supposed to see something yes. there. The the ministry of Jesus. Th- this I was led to before the Prophecy Watchers Conference back in June, like a couple of days before. So I changed my presentation very quickly on the fly to incorporate this information. Why did Jesus choose to begin his ministry where he did? In fact, yes. where in, where was he baptized? A, a German scholar, uh, Rainier Razor, and I'm probably not pronouncing his name correctly, wrote a paper on the uh, the location of Bethany across the Jordan, which is mentioned in John 1, verse 28, where uh, D- G- he's confronted by the, the Pharisees and the scribes, and they're, they're demanding to know who he is. Why are you baptizing? Why are you promising a baptism of, re- of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Who gives you this authority? Mm. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the Messiah? No. But he's among you. One is coming Who's the, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. Right. And according to John, these things happened at Bethany across the Jordan where he was baptizing. Not and, Bethany and that, in uh, Jerusalem. That is not Beth. No, because across the Jordan is a phrase that means east of the Jordan River. Right. And Bethany on the Mount of Olives is the only Bethany that anyone's ever heard of. Right. And so as early as the third century, there were Christians who were trying to find Bethany across the Jordan. So I want to know where Jesus got baptized. And the United Nations has designated a site across from Jericho on the Jordan side of the river yeah. as Bethany across the Jordan. There are respected archaeologists who believe that that is the location of Bethany across the Jordan. I think the evidence points farther north. John... Uh, was baptizing at Bethany. Now, 1877, Claude Condor for the Palestine Exploration Fund Mm -hmm. uh, wrote that the Greek name Bethania was probably a transliteration of the term Batania, which is the Greek name for Bashan, the ancient kingdom of Og, which is a a huge dolmen field. It's essentially the Golan Heights. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when you look at the location of the dolmens north of the Sea of Galilee, the Golan, which is east of the Jordan River, right, And even the area on the west side of the Jordan, when you get north of the Sea of Galilee, is just covered with dolmens. In fact, the archaeologist who led Israel's survey of the Golan Heights, Moshe Hartal, wrote uh, less than 10 years ago, we can't use the phrase, the term dolmen fields anymore because you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. For all intents and purposes, the Golan Heights is one giant dolmen field. You can put a map up showing that yes. with little red pens or red dots. wherever They're everywhere. I, yes. They are seriously everywhere. And one of the structures in that region is Gilgal Rephaim. Right. The, the Wheel of the Giants. Correct. And you discovered... Now, you were the second person, too, because Doug Van Doren discovered it first, we found out. Right. Just uh, a quarter of a mile north of there, uh, visible from space, thanks to Google Earth and Apple Mm -hmm. Maps and so forth, is a serpent-shaped mound that uh, an archaeologist, Dr. Michael Friedman, Mm -hmm. excavated within the last 10 years. And he found that uh, going back to the Copper Age, so pre-Bronze Age, which means more than 5,000 years ago, there were settlements on the back of this ridge, but th- that, that serpent-shaped ridge is covered with megalithic burials. So you've got dolmens and tumuli, which are big piles of rocks that are piled on top of the dolmens. On the back of that ridge... Which is 25 feet high. It's 25 feet high, about 200 feet wide. It makes the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio look like a, a, an earthworm, like to be a honest. Baby. Yeah, this is three quarters of a mile long. So mm. it's uh, like three times longer, five times higher, and 200 feet wide, covered with megalithic burials. So, um, and it's within eyesight of Mount Hermon and yes. it's in the middle of the Golan Heights, which again, one giant dolmen field. Yes. This and is it, why the term that this is why Bashan was, uh, considered the, the entrance to the netherworld. Well, it was the name, basically the cult of the dead. The name means place of the serpent. Place of the serpent. And here you've got a three quarter of a mile long, 200 foot wide serpent covered with tombs. It's pretty obvious. It's also along that rift which again was opened up, I believe, when the fountains of the deep, the deep the opened abyss, up. Yeah. So it would have been revered 
as a, a an entry point to the underworld. Well, yeah. In fact, that was essentially we're describing my presentation for the True Legends con virtual conference back in 2020, ah. which was about this whole thing and what all of the supernatural things that have happened along that rift from Baalbek in the north down to the uh, Dead Sea in the south, or the Red Sea, really. Well, how does this connect to the Lord's ministry? He... Uh, of course, uh, according to J the Gospel of John, the very next verse after he writes, these things took place in Bashan across the Jordan, in other words, north of the Sea of Galilee, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then we go down a few more verses. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked as Jesus walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus called his first disciples from north of the Sea of Galilee. When you look at where Peter and Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel came from, they were all from Bethsaida, which is north of the Sea of Galilee. And in fact, it's just a half mile from a monument, megalithic monument, similar to Gilgal Rephaim, called Kerbet Betaha, which overlooks the Jordan River. Now, this megalithic oh. site is smaller than Gilgal Rephaim. Is Ten it east of the Jordan? It is east of the Jordan. It's on a little hill. You know, the Jordan Valley runs below it, and uh, it is less than half a mile, really, from Bethsaida, the hometown of Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and Andrew. Oh my they goodness. would have known that it was there, and this was the region where John was baptizing, Bashan, across the Jordan. Oh my goodness. Jesus moved there according to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 4 where he writes that uh, Jesus, by moving to Capernaum after the arrest of John the Baptist, uh, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. I'm going to find it here. I've got it highlighted. Mm -hmm. uh, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, that's the Roman road, the Via Maris, right. beyond the Jordan, yes. east of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. This, according to Matthew, was the beginning of Jesus beginning to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Je this was the prophecy in Isaiah where uh, he writes, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So this was the fulfillment. Jesus moving into this region of these dolmens that were constructed by who? Somebody who could lift these yes. immense rocks. A long, long time ago. Yes. He was speaking not only to the human beings. He was preaching to the fallen realm. He was saying, I'm here. I'm fulfilling prophecy. And next week, yes. he didn't say this part, but next <laughs> week, Derek and I will cover why he said it there and how that relates to the book of parables. Oh, yes. It, there is a connection here between the location, the geography of Jesus' ministry, and uh, the book of Enoch, surprisingly enough. Yes. Most of us are familiar, at least if you watch this program and followed us for any length of time, you've heard of the book of the Watchers, mm -hmm. which is the first 36 chapters of First Enoch. Beginning at chapter 37 is a section scholars call the book of parables, mm -hmm. and it turns out that is really, really influential on the New Testament, and the book of Revelation. And the people that Jesus preached to. So you need to watch next week. Absolutely. Thank you for watching Sci Friday. Sci Friday is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at SciFriday.tv and GilbertHouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us each week as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri 65633.